Dr. Rob, can you tell us a little bit about the 3A, 2B rule? Like, what is that? Where does it come from? Why does it matter? The 3A, 2B rule is a guideline. And so I use the word rule and guideline interchangeably. Sometimes that in itself gets people a little bit stuck. They're like, it's a rule. You can't break rules. Well, I'm, I, I break a lot of rules, right? I got in a lot of trouble as a kid growing up, broke a lot of rules, but um, it's a guideline. And the guideline is, 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 is a very, very powerful guideline. And the reason is, is it gives us a starting point for where to place a dental implant in general. And let me explain. You, you want to start your design process with the end in mind, Stephen Covey. You're going to start with the, the idealized solution, the idealized prosthodontic solution. So let's call it a single crown. Once you create that single crown, you want to make sure that your implant is underneath that single crown so that the predominant, the majority of the loads, the, the, the chewing and the bite loads that are transferred from the crown to the implant are directly on top of the implant for mechanical reasons, okay? For longevity of the solution, okay? To keep it strong and healthy without having complications like abutment screw loosening, abutment screw breakage, cement breakage between your crown and your abutment, uh, 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 the implant itself breaking, bad things, okay? So to prevent those bad things from happening, you want the force to be directly on top of the tooth and the tooth to be directly on top of the implant. So. We've got this, this idea that we know exactly the position of the implant. It needs to be underneath the tooth. But how deep? Well, this has always been a problem for me because initially, dental implants were driven by an anatomical approach. And when we say anatomical approach, what we mean is the way we used to do dental implants is we would look in the mouth, uh, look for bone, place implant in bone, okay? It was that, it was that simple. Just look, look for where there was bone, place the implant in the bone. If it integrates, then build a tooth on it. And then hopefully, hopefully, you get a decent result. And the problem is we, we, we got a lot of problems we, with the aesthetics. You know, So if we look to the pink aesthetic score and the white aesthetic score, they were woefully poor, woefully poor. Like, three, like two thirds of all implants are less than ideal. Okay, so really, really poor, poor outcomes, which just simply meant that we had an opportunity to really improve, okay? And so the 3A rule means that the implant ideally should be three millimeters below the desired free gingival margin of the solution you're designing. Now, if the solution, if the, if the crown is missing, use the adjacent teeth, the zenith height of the adjacent teeth to determine where your zenith is virtually, and then you wanna go three millimeters apical to that. Now, there are times where you might wanna go a little bit deeper, and there's, there are times when you might go a little bit shorter. But in general, the starting point is three millimeters below the desired free digital margin. Now you've got your depth. The 2B rule says is you'd like to have two millimeters of bone on the buckle. Now, the two millimeters of bone on the buckle help to ensure that the, that the grave the gray value that, that's created by the implant doesn't show through your pros or through the, your, the buckle or labial flange of your bone. So if the bone is thick enough, you're not gonna see it, okay? So that's a good thing. The second thing is, is that the cortical bone that's on the buckle of, of humans is typically, on the buckle of a tooth, is typically one millimeter. So when we take a tooth out, if we put the implant concomitant with that one millimeter, it's all cortical bone. And the problem with that is this, cortical bone doesn't have good blood flow. Cortical bone's blood supply predominantly comes from the periodontal ligaments inside the socket. It comes from the, and, and then it comes from the outside, which is the periosteum on the, on the facial side. Okay, so that's where the blood supply for a, core, for a thin cortical plate comes from. The third possible opportunity for blood supply would be through the bone marrow, right? But cortical bone doesn't have marrow. It's, it's cortical bone by nature. So that fat wall doesn't have a good blood supply. So when you remove the periodontal ligaments, if you put the bone, if you put the, the, uh, the metal right up against that plate, you, you've removed one of the two blood supplies. If you flapped the case, you're really at, at, at a possible opportunity for a defect because if you flap it, you destroy the peri you destroy the periosteum blood supply, and then you can have some necrosis as it takes about six to seven days for that blood supply to reanastomize, to reattach, and then supply that buccal bone.
So if you come back a millimeter from that millimeter plate, and so you leave the millimeter plate intact and you come back a millimeter with your implant, and then you graft that gap with bone graft, there's a nice space in there for blood to flow and for you to get nice, good bone integration. It blocks out the grayness so you don't see it through the soft tissue. Now, this is irrespective of tissue thickness. So I don't do a lot of soft tissue uh, grafting with my implants. A lot of people do soft tissue grafting with all implants. And the reason is, is that obviously if you thicken the buccal thickness of the, of the, of the, connect, of the, of the soft tissue and you double it, so you take it from 1.2 to 1.3 millimeters, normal human beings thickness is about 1.3, okay, on the facial. And then you double it and you make it two millimeters thick, you can block out the, the underlying grayness. And hopefully by adding that one millimeter, you don't create a visual defect in the, in the, in the pink. Okay, so you can do that. But if you place the implant back a millimeter, a lot of times you don't need to do that. So you can just leave the, t the pink the way it has always been, the way God made it, which I find to be a little bit easier, <laughs> right? Just leave a good thing alone and don't mess with it. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. And it doesn't mean you can't do it as a, as a, as a recovery. So say for instance, you inherit a case, the case comes to you and you can see the grayness showing through the, the, the facial of the, of the implant and the patient has a high smile. And so when they smile, you can see it and they go, is there anything you can do? Do a connective tissue graft. Do, 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 do a connective tissue graft. It'd be a beautiful thing. Thicken it up and you may be able to get, get it thick enough to, to hide that tissue. But for, for my practice, what I do is I use the 2B rule, get the bone thick enough and I don't typically have to mess with that. Now, I just don't have to mess with it. So it's, it's a nice thing. So, the 3A gets you in the right position depth-wise. The 2B gets you in the right position buccal lingual. So those, that's one of the 21 guidelines that we use for placing dental implants and getting them in the ideal location for minimizing risk and improving outcome for the long haul. And that's why if you do all of these things through the Implant Made Simple method, the longevity of your solution in most cases should be the, for the patient's entire life. And I really feel confident in that. And you've just completely made this up on the spot, right? Like this is not from any sort of science. Yeah. This is just from your head thinking about it, right? Yeah. So that's that. The, coming back to your original question, this this comes from pretty much all of the greats. So you can find references to the to. It wasn't called the three A two B rule until uh, I think around 2013, when it was uh, when there was a graduate student at UNC that published that work, and then he kind of made the three A two B. Uh, it was the title of his paper, it was in the title. And it's just a really easy and clever way to remember it uh, and to communicate with your colleagues in labs. 3A, 2B, three millimeters apical for the platform, two millimeters of buccal bone, and you're in pretty good shape. Okay, that's a starting point. But it, 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 you can go back as far as, I think, 2004, and you start to see it popping up in Tarnow's work. You see it popping up in, in Mish's work. You see it popping up in... Coyce's work, you see it popping up in Lyndon Cooper's work, uh, you see it popping up in Chu's work, you see it all over the place with some of the greats. To think that I just kind of came up with it was, would be silly. Yeah, but th those are all just like old guys, they're washed, it doesn't apply <laughs> anymore, right? Yeah, those those guys, they're like at least 10 years old, so uh, yeah. Yeah, we're not going to listen to them anymore. Right. Yeah, no, I think... Um, I think it was really, really interesting that they figured that out early on. And I think one of the main things is that if you don't get, if you don't get your implant deep enough, you don't have enough emergence room. You don't have enough, uh, you don't have enough room to create the ideal emergence profile. So we've talked about the three shapes, the three, you know, radiographic shapes that we talk about, the Snoopy, the ET, and the heart. Well, the heart is what you want your two-dimensional radiograph to look like. If you have a heart-like solution, if it comes up and then it blossoms out like a heart, you've got the implant probably not, not knowing about the buccal lingual because it's a two-dimensional radiograph. But if you've got that right too, you've got a solution that likely will last a very, very long time. Well, the only way to get a heart and not end up with an ET is to get the implant deep enough. Because if you don't get the implant deep enough and then you go to build the crown, you got a lollipop on a stick, you got a mushroom, you got an ET, a skinny neck and a, and a, and a wide solution. Now, the problem with the ET, as we've talked about multiple of times, is that that skinny neck is a risk factor. That's where it's going to break because the stress factor, the stress in the prosthodontic solution goes straight through the roof. Okay. And then the last solution would be a Snoopy. Now, a Snoopy is a cantilever and the Snoopy results in 
results from getting the implant not in the right position. The implant's placed too far to the mesial or too far to the distal. When you build the final tooth, when you look at it under a radiograph, a two-dimensional radiograph, it looks like a Snoopy, like a dog, right? And the problem with that is you, you, you've created a bending moment. So you've got a cantilever, which creates a bending moment. And you're putting your entire solution into bending, which it hates. The cement hates it. The abutment screw hates it. The implants hate it. Everything hates a bending moment. So if that's your solution, the, you, you, the potential for high complications, the potential for complications is high. It's really high. So you, you want to try to get it with that, with that emergence profile that comes from getting it at least three millimeters apical. Now, in certain cases, for instance, like a molar, you may want to go a little bit deeper because the molar is wider. And so in order to have this kind of beautiful emergence profile, uh, as you get a wider tooth, you have to go a little bit deeper in order to get that profile. So you might, on a molar, go closer to four millimeters. And then when you might go shallow, more shallow, is on a young person. So when you go to do congenitally missing laterals on someone, let's say they're 25 years old, they've been in, a, they've been in um, some sort of temporary solution their whole life, they've had congenitally missing laterals, and mom and dad are finally you know, paying them, for. they just finished grad school, and it's time to get their teeth, okay? And you're gonna place implants. I don't, play, I don't place those implants three millimeters apical. I place them two millimeters apical. And the reason, the apical to the desired free of margin, and the reason is, is the bone continues to grow. And so you can see in your in your own practice if you've tracked cases over ten years, or if you just saw, if you just watch some of the lectures and we have a lecture on it, and Tarno has a lecture on it, and there's many people that have lectures on the fact that implants are ankylosed, they do not move, but the teeth continue to go even after puberty. Now this is an important thing that people don't understand. They think that well, you're, you're a full grown man at 23, 24, you can get an implant now because we initially thought that that was the safe zone. Yeah, most of your growing is done, but we don't stop growing. And the maxilla will continue to grow, and after about a decade, you'll literally see, visually see, your crown that you delivered 10 years ago will be short in the mouth. The incisal edge will be short, and the other teeth will have super erupted. And it just happens all the time. So what we do with, with congenitally missing laterals is we wanna start a little bit shallow, because they're, they're 25 years old, they got another 75 years on this planet. And what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna start three millimeters apical, and then in 10 years now, it's four millimeters apical. And by the time they're 50, it's five millimeters apical or six millimeters apical to the desired frigid margin. So I start a little bit shallow. So remember, the 3A, 2B rule is a guideline. Guidelines can be, can be bent if you understand the premises behind them, the purpose for them. So for instance, let's say for the 2B rule, you have someone who's 55 years old with, you can't see the, the free gingival margin. You can't see it at all. They have a very low smile line. That's never gonna change. So you're not too terribly worried if you, if you had the choice to put in an implant and compromise the two millimeter rule by going to one and a half millimeters, say, and you were concerned that you might have some soft, some pink, uh, some uh, gray showing through, who cares? The only time that you might even see it is during a hygiene check when you pull the lip back. And if you're okay with that, and the patient says, I'm okay with that, and you, you don't, and, and you can tell them, and if you don't like it, we can do a connective tissue graft later. And you've got that option. But knowing what the baseline is, and then using that to allow you to be uh, creative in your solution so that you can try to help more people, that's the goal, right? But you gotta know, you gotta have a coordinate system. You have to have a reference frame to start with in order to know how to deviate from that to solve problems for people and give them a beautiful solution. So that's where the 3A, 2B rule is, is all in the literature, which is so funny because it took me forever to find it. It took me forever to find it because nobody talked about it because I don't know why they, well, I know why. The 3A, 2B rule did not become necessary or as important as it did once digital planning came. And here's why. Prior to that, we did an anatomical approach. Well, an anatomical approach has flap the ridge, look at the bone, place the implant in the bone. So despite the fact that we would say, well, we want it three millimeters below the desired free digital margin, you would eyeball it. You, you might, if you, were, if you were on that cutting edge and you knew that, you wouldn't place it at, at some sort of arbitrary level of bone because we know there is no level bone, but you would place it by eyeballing the adjacent teeth and then maybe place it, and if you were good, you would get it in the right depth, okay? The, the problem is that when we go digital, it scares people. And the reason it scares people is because you have 100% con control over where the virtual implant goes. It's not a guess anymore. 
It's it's a hundred percent. You get to tweak it by a tenth of a millimeter, up, down, left, right, everywhere you want it. And so if you don't, if you're not used to having that kind of control, it kind of freaks you out. You you look at it and you go, I got all I got all the control in the world. I really don't. I don't. I've never had this kind of control before. I just look in the mouth and kind of drill until I think it's right. Now you get to control what's right. So now having a starting point like three millimeters apical to the desired free digital margin is enormously powerful. And same thing with the 2B rule. So we're working closely with the big design, the big design companies like 3Shape and, and ExoCAD, trying to get them to implement a, a rules section or a guideline section inside their software. And that guideline section would create a factor safety window, kind of like your placement factor safety window that are in most of them already. So typically you have a, a factor of safety, two millimeters apical from a, from a nerve, that kind of thing. And it creates a little outline. Well, you could imagine that we could create some other outlines around the implant that would take into account the prosthodontic concerns, and they would be adjustable. So you could go into the preferences and say, I always want mine to be at 3.5 millimeters apical or 4 millimeters apical or 3, whatever, whatever it is that you do in your practice to make your solutions work. You can change it and set it so it's not fixed and then set forever. So we're hoping that to see those, we were told, 3Shape told me that we were uh, – Product improvement 68 <laughs> in the <laughs> list. So we, we, it might be a while before we actually see that. But yeah, hopefully, that's encouraging. Hopefully we'll see it sometime before I die. Well, at least it's coming. Yep. That, that's all I can ask is that they listen and that they make those improvements so that it can, it can benefit just everyone. Yeah. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.